Hi, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Chandra um, Parks. I am the chair of the emergency response team with the North Arundel County Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. So we wanna thank you for coming out this evening on behalf of our um, president, Dr. Sean Asper. We wish you um, greetings this evening and thank you for taking the time to to join us on our first um, ERT um, community outreach um, webinar this evening, virtual workshop. And we would like to thank Mr. James Crumpel with the Anne Arundel County Office of Emergency and Management, who will be providing us information this evening on the topic of snow pandemic. Yes, winter is coming and we are in the midst of a pandemic. And so, with everything that is going on, we want to make sure that we get information out to the, com to the community about being properly prepared um, in the midst of the winter season, um, in the midst of the pandemic, which is new for almost everyone and what we are experiencing. So I don't want to hold everyone too long, but I definitely would like to um, turn this time over to Mr. James Crumple, and we'd like to thank you um, so very much for um, joining us this evening. And if you have any questions, um, feel free to put them in the chat. And as time permits, we'll definitely make sure that your answers are, um, sorry, your questions um, get answered. So once again, thank you for joining in this evening. Well, Chandra, thank you for inviting us from the Emergency Management Office. Uh, our office is located up in Glen Burnie. We're next to the county courthouse, uh, right off uh, uh, Ritchie Highway and Crane Highway, right across from AACC and the county skating rink up there. Uh, we are a small office of about 10 people, uh, ranging in age from about uh, 20 to, to myself, about 67. So it's a, a wide range of, of backgrounds and ages and genders and disciplines. So we try to represent the entire county. And what we do is plan for the unthinkable. And right now, as you'll hear and, and are proud of, the pandemic is something we never really expected. We expected perhaps epidemics, like we have the flu epidemic, we have the COVID, uh, the uh, uh, measles epidemic, but certainly not something as wide as our uh, global pandemic. And we'll talk about that. So uh, as I understand it, as an emergency response team, are you organized to support the community in emergencies or support your, your fellow sisters? How does it work? Thank you for um, asking that question. So what our service is to make sure that we do inwardly with our fellow um, sorority sisters, as well as outwardly to the community and making sure that we are a re resource uh, within the community as well. So that's the reason why we like to kind of partner with the Anne Arundel County Office of um, Emergency Management team so we can have that particular partnership in order to support um, our sisters as well as the community. Well, that's fantastic. Uh so we're going to talk about a lot of things during this presentation. We'll talk about how you can protect yourself, your family, and your community. And at the end, I'm going to give you some, some uh, suggestions for volunteer work and for actually uh, becoming a more formal part of the emergency management group if you'd like to do that, upping your game a little bit. And we have a lot of citizens group that does that. You're very well organized to do that. So appreciate even, even what you're doing now. So let me switch this on and we can begin. Uh, ground rules are anybody can ask a question anytime. You can either uh, unmute your mic and ask a question or you can put it in the chat box. If you think of a question for the end, you're welcome to do that too. Write it down, we can answer at the end. And for those that love to take notes, you're welcome to do it, but I'll send a PDF copy of this to Chandra and she can send it to everyone. And I, you're recording it, plus the PDF can be sent it out anywhere you want to. This is all public information. If something that I give you is an opinion, I'll tell you it's an opinion, uh, but, but this is all public information, we want it shared. And service sororities like you are a perfect way to get it shared across our community. So thank you so much. Okay, can everybody see that? Can you see my pointer moving? Okay, good, good. All right, so let me switch the view here. All right, so we're gonna be talking about what we call snowdemic. That's winter weather preparedness during a global pandemic, a place we've never been before. Uh, during the summer, we have a companion presentation we'd love to give you when it comes back around again, we call Herodemic. And we actually got to experience Herodemic when the tropical storm Isaias came through here. Thank goodness it wasn't any worse than it was. 
So this is your typical natural disaster. Nothing's typical. If you've been in one natural disaster, you've, you've been in one natural disaster. They're all different. We plan for things that are natural, like snowstorms and ice storms and tornadoes and hurricanes. And we plan for things that are man-made, like active shooters, hazardous material, that sort of thing. So anything that could happen across the entire county. So you've probably heard of the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA. That's the federal counterpart to what we do. And then at Reisterstown is the Maryland Emergency Management Agency, or MEMA. That's our state counterpart. And then each of the 23 uh, uh, counties and three municipalities, major municipalities, have their own emergency management office. Can anybody uh, give me the name of the three municipalities? One's a giveaway. It's just north of us. You can type it in or, or just unmute and tell me what it is. Nobody can ever figure out the third one. So the first one is easy. What's north of what's north of the county? Big city. The biggest city in the in the state. What is that? Baltimore City. Baltimore City. Yep, of course. Now, the the second separate municipality that has its own emergency management is a hand. It's south of where we are in Glen Burnie. Prince George's County. No, no, it's a it's a separate municipality. They're they're a county. They have their own. Annapolis City. Oh, they Annapolis. Have their own, own separate office of emergency management that works with us all the time. So if you if anybody on the call lives in Annapolis, they have their own OEM as well. And I will certainly be glad to link you up with them. Now the hard question is what is the third independent municipality that our state recognizes? I'll give you a hint. It's on the eastern shore. Queen Anne's County. Well, no, all the counties are covered. Yeah, you're correct. But this is a separate city on the Eastern Shore. Salisbury? Ocean City. Ocean City. They have their own complete separate emergency management. And that's because it's such a big tourist attraction and they could mm -hmm. be hit by hurricanes. So they have a separate. Now, other small towns like Bowie and, and Laurel and a number of other small towns, Clinton, I think, does have their own emergency managers for their small towns. But the 23 counties and the major municipalities. So that's part of what we are now. So this is what we'd face in a typical natural disaster. Uh, so if we had a snowstorm, it would impact part of the county more than others, depending on the snowfall. It's usually limited duration. It could come through in just a few hours or maybe a couple of days if it's a big storm. It involves some physical destruction and that could be blocked roads or utility outages or maybe a building loads too much snow and the roof collapses. It could, because of that, involve some injuries, not likely, but possible. Whereas if we had a tornado, for example, there could be a lot of injuries. Our lead county agency in the field for something like this is usually the fire department. They're supported by emergency medical services uh, and by our police department. And of course, by our public works and the other agencies of the county. Our responders and the hospitals themselves are not usually in danger during these things. We heavily use volunteers during these natural emergencies and it could have significant financial impact to some. So if your business has been impacted, uh, you might need to get on your feet again. And it could require a long-term recovery plan. So if you think about Ellicott City, um, they had the two back-to-back, -back, uh, two years apart. That's a once in a thousand year flood that they had two years apart. So don't forget probability and occurrence are two different things. Um, and they're still recovering from it. In fact, Superstorm Sandy, which we'll talk about as a nor'easter, that came through in, in 2011 and they're still recovering from it in, in parts of Jersey and, and New York. COVID is different as you very well know, because you're living it. It has impacts around the globe, all the way into your own home and your own family. It's a novel disaster. It's not something we see. Now we've seen pandemics before and we've seen epidemics before, but nothing of this scale since 1918. It's an unknown illness without a vaccine. Well, fingers crossed, hopefully within a couple of weeks, we will have at least two vaccines. We'll talk about that. And the duration is unknown. So it'll probably be at least two years by the time the thing it runs its course week back to normal. There's no direct physical destruction. So it's not a tornado or high winds, but it's interrupted every part of our normal lives. I think there's not a caller, a person on this call that wouldn't disagree with that. Uh, especially those uh, uh, like uh, the doctor, Ash Dr. Ashworth, who's part of our school system, they've really been impacted by this as have all of our kids. We've had some long-term mandatory public safety orders, which are unique. We've never done that before in this county or in this state. So some orders are out there to protect the public safety and they have the enforcement of law behind them. And our lead counter agency is the health department. So instead of the fire department, the police that you normally think of, this is the health department. So in, in emergency management function uh, parlance, we call this uh, emergency support function for medicine and health and they are our lead agency there. 
And in this case, our responders in hospitals, the frontline workers for this, is not a firefighter putting out a, a fire or rescuing somebody. It's a nurse, a doctor, or a, or a tech in a hospital that are endangered themselves every minute of every day, more so than, than any of the rest of us. We selectively use volunteers, and we do have a number of volunteers helping us, and I'll talk about that at the end, but we give them special training for that. And this is having a widespread catastrophic financial impact. Our recovery will be in terms of years, maybe even a decade. So it's very different than a normal event. It's a complex disaster, as you see here. It's not just public health, but it has all of these echoes across the board in all these other different uh, functions that could happen, from closing business to the increased stresses of losing jobs, creating domestic violence. And of course, we're having a lot of protests right now because we're trying to get our civil rights. I'm a, I'm a, a veteran of the 1960s uh, when, when Dr. King was trying to do things, and we're now trying to come forward with that. And, and thank God we're doing that. But it's all happening at the same time, so it makes it very complex. And of course, we have a lot of homelessness now as people are pushed into poverty. So the counties responded across the board. Uh, we have, of course, very visible our emergency medical services there. You see them in their protective gear there with a COVID victim they're taking to the hospital. You have uh, all of our testing that we have out now. We'll talk about that too. So our health okay. department is working with a lot of testing right now. Several mm -hmm. Please, please mute, please mute your... Uh, Mute your oh. speaker, your oh. microphone. Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I think I was muted generally too. Can you hear me again? So typically during a storm, uh, we are, our, uh, our emergency operations center is operational for three days to a week or so. Uh, our EOC has been operational now for eight months. So we have a whole host of volunteers, county employees, and our, our emergency management staff that are working there uh, every single day. These are some of our volunteer call takers, and I'll give you an, a chance to volunteer for that as we go along. These are some more volunteers working at our food bank. So our county food bank down in Crownsville has actually put out almost 4 million, million pounds of food to those in need since this crisis started. Have a lot of people in homelessness, so we have our health department and our social services out there helping them out. And of course, our emergency operations center is used for giving press briefings. This is Dr. Kalyana Raman. He's our health officer. And of course, Mr. Pittman, our county executive. And our director, uh, uh, Ms. Preeti uh, Emrick, works for uh, the county executive directly. So this is needed a whole community response. So you've heard the adage that lots of hands make for light work. Well, that's really true here. All of these different functions are now working together in this, plus a lot of volunteers. So we're really glad you're on tonight. Uh, you're already doing some work. We hopefully will be able to get you to do some more work. So this is a good example. So because of the poverty, our hungry level has gone up 300%. We actually have a county food warm line now. They're 222 food or 3663. And people can call no matter what their circumstances are and get help getting fed. Uh, we don't care if you're a single mom with a baby who's homeless. Uh, or, or even if you have money, but you have some food needs, we can, we can do that too. Uh, that's also a good way to get other kinds of help. Uh, if you need uh, WIC support, if you need uh, uh, support from social services, you can call that line and we'll give you support. We have a whole community effort of feeding the hungry. Uh, it's, it's with the food bank, several religious organizations, nonprofits, our public schools, uh, the Partnership for Children and Youth, uh, both us and uh, uh, Annapolis Emergency Management, our city, county, police, and fire, and the community emergency response team, uh, and other volunteers all working together to feed the needy at several locations every week. And again, we'll give you an opportunity to help if you're not already doing that. Stop me, please, if you have any questions or comments. I'm going fast, but remember, you'll get a copy of all of this. So I look at this as a, as a glass half full. I'm a, pretty much an optimist. Uh, I was a 36-year Army officer. Uh, and I saw a lot of things around the world. And I, I think people are generally pretty good, despite the horrors that might happen. And I think uh, in this case, our county and our state and our nation have really pulled together well. So it's given us a chance for all reassessing our priorities, both as individuals, as families, and as communities. And out of that has come some novel procedures and really creative solutions. The Zoom call we're having tonight is one example of that. A year ago, nobody knew what Zoom was. Now we can safely have meetings. You can be in the comfort of your own living room or even on your car and have a meeting and learn something and then exchange. 
So we have some great unexpected partnerships. So one of the things that I do during this crisis is I'm the volunteer coordinator plus community outreach. So I'm talking about preparedness, but also bringing new coalitions together. And we have about 27 new organizations that are now working with us and working together. Again, many hands make for easy job. All of that together increases our resilience, our ability to bounce back quickly from an emergency. So as we saw when Tropical Storm Isaias came through uh, uh, earlier this year, uh, we actually had two emergency operation centers running at the same time, one for the COVID crisis and one for the, for the tornado or the uh, or hurricane. Fortunately, it moved very quickly through, but those new organizations that we had from uh, the COVID crisis were all working with us. So that'll improve our whole county for the future. And definitely you are part of it and we want you to be more of a part of it. So we've talked about that and now let's talk about snowdemic. What do we do with this weather, cold weather in the pandemic? So Maryland has a lot of different kinds of severe weather. Uh, and as you see this whole list here that talks about the entire year. Uh, during winter, we have a smorgasbord of things that could happen to us. And we'll talk about each of these. So about the only thing that we don't have here is tsunamis. Technically possible, but the Atlantic has never really come up with a tsunami. That's more of a Pacific thing. And we haven't put it on here, but we do also have earthquakes. If you're around in 2011, we had an earthquake. It started in Virginia and came up this way. So first, let's give you some weather terminology. So if you are uh, watching the news uh, each night and list the weatherman, they'll generally give you a weekly outlook. So the outlook for this week has been pretty much of a chilly week, as you can see. It was, it was warm a couple of weeks ago. It's been chilly. Uh, we've been flirting and freezing, and we're going to have heavy rain coming in uh, tomorrow going into, or Friday going to Saturday. Uh, so during these outlooks, we say be prepared so you'll know ahead what's coming. And we'll tell you how to look for what's coming. And then they have advisories. An advisory is a weather hazard that could cause an inconvenience. It's like not life-threatening. But if you have to commute to DC or commute to Baltimore or commute somewhere else in the state and there's a half an inch of snow on the ground, sometimes that's a lot more than inconvenience. So we ask you to plan very carefully. A watch is severe weather is possible. So it could be a snowstorm, an ice storm. The conditions are right. It's very possible to happen. Stay tuned for more information and be ready to take action. And finally, a warning means the weather is likely or already happening, and it's possibly life-threatening. In that case, you take action, and we'll tell you how to do that. So this is a nor'easter. Best example I can give you is Superstorm Sandy that happened in 2011. Uh, that is a mix of heavy rain, sometimes snow, and strong winds that cause a lot of coastal flooding. So it comes in from the northeast as opposed to typically coming in from the west to the east. This comes in from the north to the east and it brings a lot of wet with it. Uh, again, they're still recovering from that. Uh, and this is a good time of year where one of those can happen. The weather is very changing this time of year. Of course, our winter storm warning is when we have five or more inches of snow or seat, sleet expected, and there could be an ice accumulation, or you've got that and wind, so the whole accumulation could be very life-threatening or damaged to property. And you'll see these, this is, usually this is called a warned event, so we'll usually get about three days warning these are coming. Uh, so as we keep talking here, we don't want you to wait for that three days of warning to go to the store and get something. Uh, I think uh, Chandra already mentioned that, that uh, some of our stores are already getting to be emptied as people are panicking for the, for the COVID crisis. They don't need to, but you don't wanna wait until a storm warning comes to go to the store. So we'll tell you how to get prepared in advance. A blizzard warning is not based on snow depth. A lot of people think a blizzard is really deep snow. It's not. A blizzard means you have falling or blowing snow, but the wind is high, 35 miles an hour and above, which reduces visi visibility to a quarter mile or less, and for three hours or longer. So in this case, the instruction would be to stay put, stay inside. And that's something we ask you to really heed. Uh, if anybody on the call has been in a blizzard, if you lived up north, uh, you probably have. They can be very treacherous. Uh, it's not something you want to drive in. It's not something you want to walk in. Just hunker down and stay, stay sheltered at home. I think this is worse for this area. An ice storm, uh, we say, uh, turn around, don't drown for a flood. For an ice storm, we talk about a quarter inch, you're in a pinch. At a quarter inch, that you have a slick of ice across the road, which makes driving very treacherous, especially with our traffic. You have what's called black ice, which looks like just wet road surface, but instead it's ice and you start skidding. And of course, then you start getting loading of the trees and the power lines, and you have those coming down creating electrical hazards, potential fires, power outages, and blocked roads. 
So I think that's about the worst thing we face. And of course you could have snow and ice going together. The other thing we face is wind chill. So during the summer, we always talk about the feels like temperature and that's the, the combination of the humidity plus the heat. In the, in the winter, it's just the opposite. It's the wind plus the cold. And the higher the wind, the colder the temperature, the quicker our body is robbed of, of its warmth. And as we'll talk about in a second, you can easily get into a hypothermic situation where your body loses heat too fast to recover. How do you make up for that? Well, you dress for the cold weather. This is common sense, but a lot of people don't think about it. So I'm a Boy Scout leader. So a lot of our young Boy Scouts will first come out their first cold weather camp out and they'll wear a very heavy coat and underneath it will just be a t-shirt. So they have two options. They're in a heavy coat, which is fine if it's really cold, but if it gets warmer or they start working out, they get sweaty, they take that coat off and now they have a sweaty cotton t-shirt, which then gets cold, could even freeze and wicks that body temperature away. So we say dress for the conditions, you dress in layers, common sense again, as it gets colder, you add layers. In extreme cold, you make sure that you have at least three layers. You have nice boots, you have gloves or mittens, and you have a face mask. And that's not just a COVID mask, but that's a cold weather mask. Again, this is common sense, but if anybody here has kids, you know sometimes common sense isn't so common. Again, please interrupt if you have any questions. We operate county warming centers if the conditions get down uh, to about 20 degrees or below and our COVID restrictions allow. Uh, this allows people who don't have warmth in their homes to come to shelter uh, for uh, warm places with restrooms, waters, and seatings. Now, this is not an overnight shelter. Although our district police stations will allow people to stay in their community rooms overnight, uh, they don't have bedding or anything like that. So we don't have medical uh, facilities, unlike our public shelters, which might be open after a hurricane. Uh, right now, our senior activities are closed and our public libraries are closed. So if we have to have a, a warming center, it would be in our four district police stations. Any questions about that? So if anybody in your neighborhood uh, faces uh, uh, dire circumstances with their cold, their electricity is out for a long time, or they simply don't have uh, the money to pay for a warm home, and you can't get them to safety, you can always call us, I'll give you our numbers, and we will get them to safety and to shelter. So all this together, as you can read down this laundry list of things that happen, so snow accumulation, seven and plus inches, and all these other things happen, uh, plus cold weather. So another quiz for everybody. So you can type into your chat box, how cold is the coldest you think that the state of Maryland has ever uh, gotten? Take a guess. I'll take a quick break. So I can't see the chat box, so somebody can monitor for me. Give me, give me some input that what's happening out there. What's the coldest the state of Maryland's ever been in its history? Think Alaska. You have minus 10, minus three, minus two in the negatives, below zero. Those are some of the things out of the chat. Minus 20. Ah, getting warmer or colder in this case. <laughs> Believe it or not, it's minus 40 degrees out in Garrett County in the 1880s. Now the same question, how cold do you think that Anne Arundel County, Baltimore area has gotten? So I won't make you guess again. It's been minus nine several times. So if you hear we get below minus nine, so if we get minus 10 degrees, then we've broken all records. And you say, well, that's not happening because everything's warming up. Well, we have a lot of weather extremes now. It's not just global warming, it's, it's entire weather extremes. So almost anything can happen. So this last year, we broke all records with, with hurricanes. We had 29 named hurricanes. We went deeply into the Greek alphabet. We went through all the English alphabet into the Greek alphabet, and we'd never had anything like it before. Uh, so we broke all records, so hold your breath. So all the things can happen at once, plus the coronavirus all happening at the same time, which means we all need to be prepared. And in, in our emergency management uh, wording, we call that cascading effects. So first things first is first, very first thing is to protect yourself. Now, we're not asking you to protect yourself because you're selfish. Nobody on this call is selfish. You wouldn't be a member of the sorority if you were. But can somebody give me one of two good reasons why you want to protect yourself first? Anybody? Unmute. Because, because once you um, take care of you and you've secured you, then you can be of help to somebody else. Absolutely correct. That's the first reason. And if something happens to you, what happens? Oh, wow. Well. No, no. Somebody has to take care of you. So right. not only can you not take care of anybody else, but somebody has to take care of you. 
So take care of self first. It sounds selfish, but it's not. So think of being on the airplane when those oxygen masks come down, they say, put it around your child or your partner first and then put the mask on yourself. Because if, if you get asphyxiated up there, there's nothing that's gonna, you're not gonna be able to help anybody. So then next you move on to secure your family. And we don't care if your family is yourself and your dog or yourself and, and several generations and, and a whole house full of people. And then you can safely check on your neighbors. We say safely because remember we are in the COVID crisis. So if you're gonna check on your neighbor, make sure you're wearing a protective mask uh, and you keep your six foot distance and see how they're doing. And then you can serve your community like you're doing tonight. So we talk about COVID now. So everyone knows the symptoms of COVID by now. If you have any questions, ask me, but we'll give you the website of our health department and it has it in tremendous detail if you don't know this already. So if you've been exposed to COVID or you're feeling ill or you have symptoms, then you can get tested. Talk to your doctor, get tested. If you're like I am and over age 60 and you have a chronic health condition, those are some listed there, then you're at greater risk. Although they've found some very fit at risk people in their 20s and 30s have come down with COVID and had some very bad after effects. So it's not just old people. About the only group that seems to be fairly, they're not immune to it because they can still spread, but fairly uh, robust is the really, really young children. So are you helping to slow the spread? Are you able and prepared to support your family? Are you willing to support your neighbors? So slow the spread is pretty easy. It really is. You'll hear this time and time again. As the governor says, wear the damn mask. It's a mask. It's not a political statement. If you wear a mask and I wear a mask, we have reduced our chances of infecting one another by 70%. Scientific fact. I don't care what your, your uh, political party is or your background is. It's not a libertarian thing. It is a scientific fact. And then use social distancing. Keep six feet away from each other. So I want everybody in the call. Nobody will see you, but go ahead and do it. Hold your hands out to your sides like you're making wings. So if you had somebody next to you, if you do, that's fine. If you have somebody next to you touching your fingertips and their hands are out at their side, then you have enough distance. That's about six feet. So your arm length is about three foot as an adult. Or if you're in a store, a shopping cart gives you about six feet. So it's a quick way to think about that distance. More is better. If you go to a church meeting, for example, you wanna sit further apart because if you're not outside, uh, the, the uh, droplets can actually probably go eight feet or more. So you want to give yourself distance and keep mask. Wash your hands often for 20 seconds. Now I want everybody to join me again. So you want to, you want to clasp your hands. Let me bring up the camera again so I make sure I'm seeing this. Okay, everybody join their hands like this. We're going to do a little drill. So everybody turns on the water after you go to the bathroom, you wash your fingertips and you dry off and you're good, right? That's not good for COVID. So if you've been out to a public place, you want to wash your hands thoroughly in running water with good soap like this. Then you want to wash between your hands. You know, wash the centers because that's a place that touches a lot of nasty stuff. And then you want to do this because your fingers get the dirtiest and you want to take care of your fingertips. That's under that soapy running water. And then rinse it off for 20 seconds. Now, 20 seconds, uh, the way the doctors do it is to sing the happy birthday song to yourself twice. So happy birthday to you twice or you can go through the alphabet. That'll give you about 20 seconds. So it's very different than the typical fingertip wash that we do, especially our kids do. That makes sense? Okay, hold on just a second here. All right, so avoid crowds, obviously. So our, our county health law now is uh, groups of 10 people or less indoors and groups of 25 or less outdoors. Uh, exemptions made for churches. Uh, churches can have 50% of their, of, their, uh, of their building code. Uh, get tested, and we'll talk about that in the next slide. And please, please, no matter what your age or health, get a seasonal flu shot. Uh, they're available now. They don't cost anything. Uh, if you don't get it through your doctor or a pharmacy, then the county will give you one. Uh, they're available easily. We don't want two pandemics. One pandemic is enough. Uh, if you're over 60 like I am, they have a, a quadrivalent flu shot that has a little more power to it. Uh, for those of us that might be uh, more susceptible. And please wear your mask. Everything I'm talking about, do for yourself, for your family and for your neighbors. So think about all as you do. And please pass this information on. Lots of COVID testing. If you call that line, our COVID line, which is in our emergency operations center, uh, they will give you instructions uh, as to how to go to a testing site and where they are when they're open. Uh, most or all of them are free. 
None of them need a doctor's note and you don't have to have symptoms to be tested. Some have no appointments, most now have appointments. But the good news is this test results is now down to two or three days. So it's pretty quick turnaround. Has anybody on the call had a test recently? How long did it take you? Whoever has their hand up, go ahead and, and unmute and tell us how long it took to get results. Took a couple, about three days. Oh, that's good. It mm -hmm. was running up to seven days. Mm -hmm. Anybody beat three days? Had one, um, not recently, but a couple of weeks ago, and it took about maybe two days. Two days? That's great. Mm -hmm. We're trying to get it to 24 hours. And it's not that the test can't be done, but the volume is so high. And when I give you the PDF for this, there'll be links to everything. So if you click on this link when you get the PDF, it'll take you right to where all the sites are right up to the minute. Now we talk about vaccinations, which we're talking about across the country right now. So vaccination are likely to begin in late December. So they're meeting on the 10th uh, to, to go ahead and give the emergency use authorization for the two first sets of vaccines. Uh, so by the time they actually get out to the field, it'll be late December. And the priorities from the Centers for Disease Control are hospitals and healthcare providers the nursing homes, homes and assisted living facilities. Anybody here have a relative in a nursing home or assisted living? Well, we've had a lot of people have a lot of trouble there because they're older people, they have health problems and they're in there very, very uh, tightly. A lot of people in a small place. Uh, so they come next. Then our first responders, so there's a police, fire and EMS, and then older adults with chronic health conditions. So they'll get to those that have the heart problems, the diabetes first, and then those are just older and more susceptible and they start working down. The two vaccines are, will be given in two doses, 21 days apart. There'll be an online registration system. It'll all be managed by our health department and there'll be vaccination clinics that you'll be assigned a time to go to. It'll be free. And then as more and more vaccines come out, more citizens will get more shots at expanded locations. The goal by this summer, hopefully, is to have a doctor's office or pharmacy vaccinate you just like you do for the seasonal flu. And at that point in time, this just becomes part of our normal routine, the new normal, that we're not in the pandemic anymore. That's where we're headed now. Fingers crossed and prayers are headed that way. Any questions about vaccinations? If you do have questions- yes, with I, do, I do have a question about the vaccination and it's please. probably very early. Um, uh, have they said anything about, you know, would, is this gonna be an annual thing? Is it going to be um, like your booster every 10 years you get one? Or is this a one and done like with the uh, childhood immunizations? That's a great question. And the answer is they're still discovering it. The best guess from medicine right now, unless there's a doctor on the call, the best guess from medicine that I've read recently, and I'm not the health department, you can go to the health department, is it'll probably eventually get like the seasonal flu where you take a seasonal vaccine. Uh, it won't be one and done. They're not sure about that kind of immunity yet. But again, the science is still being worked out even these more months in. So that's a great question. Hi, Mr. Cromwell. There was a question in the chat. It says, is there any information thus far related to the impacts on children? Um, someone was doing you know, research. So just wanted to know the impact, I guess, COVID or the vaccination or what that would be in terms of on children. Okay, the impact of coronavirus or the vaccine? So uh, coronavirus typically is not, is not affecting young children very much. Okay. Um, that's, they're down in like the two or 3% that get infected. Okay. But they can be infective when they're doing it. So they might not get symptoms, they might not get sick, but they could be throwing off the, 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 uh, the bacteria, the uh, virus while they're sick. And you might not be able to tell. As okay. Far as, um as far as the virus go, I don't know that they really have settled science on that or not. So I think, yeah, the person to clarify, it was um, in reference to the vaccine, the vaccination for children. No, no they don't have any settled science. What I recommend is, is you go to the uh, CDC website uh, and that will link you out to a lot of the research. You can actually look and see where that's going. I haven't okay. seen anything on, on children on the vaccine yet. Okay, thank you. Because again, they're worried about our most at risk right now, which tends to be the opposite end, the older people with all the chronic illnesses. But that's a great question too. So quickly, some winter weather hazards. Hopefully that won't be you in the picture. So we already talked about illness. So we've got our normal winter colds, whether you're young or old, uh, you've got uh, different kinds of allergies, you've got the flu, and of course we've got COVID. You might be exposed to the cold. Uh, you might have falls. 
and you might be engaged in hazardous activities, all things to think about during the winter. So the first thing we talk about is exposure and we talk about hypothermia. Uh, the body's normal temperature is 98.6. Actually, they're proving it's a little bit lower than that. But if you get to 95 or below, you're actually in a dangerous situation in that your organs, your critical organs start shutting down. And hypothermia means that your body cannot catch up to its warmth internally. And so it shows all of these different symptoms here. So if you're out working, walking with a friend and they haven't been sick before, and they start sh showing these symptoms uh, together, then one of two things is happening. Either they may be getting hypothermia if it's really cold, uh, or perhaps if they're older, especially, they may be having a stroke. In either case, bring them indoors and call 911. It's that simple. Uh, if it's just hypothermia, uh, if it's just the beginnings of hypothermia, they'll be, they'll be shivering uh, and, and they'll, they'll be cold. You'll know they're cold and bring them into warmth. If they start warming up immediately, don't worry about that. Just keep them warm. If, however, uh, they go through all of these, then it could be something that's life-threatening because again, the body could shut down. So we're talking about get them inside, remove the wet clothing, uh, go ahead and get medical attention, and then place, if you think they have frostbite, so you warm them under layers of dry blankets and clothing. If you think they have frostbite, if, if their skin is, is wooden feeling and numb and white, then you wanna put them in warm water, warm to touch water, not, not hot water, because we actually damage the tissues of the skin. So just like you're warming them slowly, you're gonna warm their, their, their outward limbs slowly. And again, if in doubt, call 911, let the experts answer this, okay? So this is something we could face, especially if you're an outdoors person or you have to work outdoors. This is especially true for those that are older with chronic conditions or if they're very young. It has nothing to do with COVID, it has to do with the environment. And of course, there's a lot of fall hazards here. Uh, we have a lot of uh, conditions for potential for, for ice, uh, for snowy ice. So we say dress for the weather. So if you do fall, you're at least able to cope with that. And then walk in pairs, walk with a friend or walk with a family member. Uh, if you have a history of falling, whether it's medical or, or maybe you have a disability, then you're more likely to fall in winter conditions. And you can see all the rest of this uh, you want to walk like uh, your Hulk, Hulk Hogan. You want to spread out that walk. Uh, you want to put the gravity over your feet and, and take short steps so you don't slide. And be very careful with heavy loads. And probably the most dangerous time is when you get out of your, uh, your car or into your car, because it could be ice right out of the car you don't know about. And getting out of the car, you don't think about taking precautions. So you could go down. My wife ended up breaking her ankle about three years ago because of an icy driveway. And we talk about snow removal. For those of you that are still robust enough to do your snow shoveling, we ask that you do it a little bit at a time and go ahead and, and push the snow in small amounts and don't lift it. A shovel full of snow can, can be 25 pounds. That's repeatedly, unless you're in really good shape, can really tax your body. Not just the muscles, but your entire circulatory system. If you have a heart issue, by all means, don't shovel snow. Either use a snow blower safely or find somebody to help you, a family member, if you can find a neighbor to help you. Teenagers are harder and harder to find. Even if you pay them, they don't want to do it anymore. But maybe you can find a good teen, uh, teenager. Make sure and drink water no matter what you're doing outside. People think because it's cold, they can't get dehydrated. It's not true. And take frequent breaks. And you don't want to drink, uh, you want to drink water. You don't want to drink alcohol. So the picture of the St. Bernard with a, with a little cask of rum under him, the coming to the Avalanche that you see in the movies, that's not true. You don't want to drink alcohol. It actually makes your, your, your body colder. So now you've heard about the COVID, you've heard about some of our, our cold hazards. Now we're going to talk about doing a family preparedness plan. And again, a family doesn't, it makes no difference if it's you and your dog or cat, or it's you and 20 people. You need to know to plan and to act. So this is all getting prepared. And when you get this, when I send you the PDF, each of these blue areas is a link to more information. We're gonna talk about a lot of these things, but you can actually click on this and get a lot more information. In fact, you can virtually work towards a PhD thesis on any of this if you're interested in doing it. I leave you with a question on this though. If you're out there volunteering or you have a job or, or God forbid uh, you're, you're a teacher or a healthcare worker or an emergency responder, who's in charge at your home when you're not home? It's a question every family has to ask. So when we give this to our fire department and our public works people, those are brave people that go out there and, and face the elements all the time, but they don't often or sometimes don't think about who's back in charge uh, when you're home. 
So you have a backup plan for your family. So it might be an older child, it might be a family member, it might be a neighbor, it might be a trusted friend. That becomes your trusted network. Some families have special needs. So if somebody has a disability, they have to plan a little earlier and more careful. Again, you don't wait for a snowstorm. Plan ahead with your family and friends or caregivers professionally, and that's called your support network. Don't shelter alone. Use your support network. Two heads are better than one. If something happens to one person, the other can help them. If you have a home health care service, they may be interrupted during a snowstorm. Uh, we also say have a, this is good for any situation, have a, a month of prescription medications on hand. So if we ever have to go into a full lockdown status, you'll have that in there. You don't have to worry about going out to your doctor or your prescriber or your or pharmacist. Uh, have spare medical devices available. So hearing aids with batteries, a walker, for example, or you might have a CPAP or an LVAD, a medical device, Make sure you have either a generator to have that, a battery system, or relocate to a place that has stable power. If you take supplemental oxygen, make sure you have enough on hand. So call your supplier, make sure there's enough on hand and they can give you more uh, or make arrangements to do that. And the same thing with a medical appointment like a dialysis or chemotherapy. Uh, call your provider and, and see if they're going to be doing that. Is your appointment still gonna be held during the snowstorm? Can you skip an appointment? Can you go to an altered location? You need special transportation to go there. So again, it's all common sense and planning ahead. Now you may say that yourself, you're 25 year old and, and you're, you're Wonder Woman and you can do almost anything, no problems at all, but you may have a family member or neighbor that you have to think through this thing through. So plan for all of these. And again, if you have a service animal, know somebody, they have to plan for their animal as well. When you get this, you click here, it'll give you a lot more detail on all of these. So think of any special needs right now, not just for yourself, but for your family and neighbors. So you think about do you shelter in place or do you evacuate? This is something we think about typically in, in a hurricane, if a hurricane's coming your way. But in a major storm, if your home is warm and sturdy, plan to stay there and weather it out in the storm. Chances are you've been through a storm before and you're totally prepared for it. If you're alone, especially if you have a disability or chronic illness, then, then move in with somebody you trust. Uh, if you don't have uh, a generator or stable power, you wanna move into some place that has stable power and warmth. If you do move somewhere, know your destination, inform that support network we keep talking about, those family, friends, and neighbors of your status. Have a go bag, and we'll talk about that too, and consider your pets. It doesn't have to be a, a, a service animal, but any pets. And if you have special needs, and you can see the, the list there, some other things to think about. And again, it may not be you, but since you're a service organization and you do have emergency response in your name, you might think about supporting your neighbors in your neighborhoods. When you get this, there's a lot more information on here. So we say, <clears throat> have a family communications plan. So again, this is your, your support network, your family, your trusted friends, trusted neighbors, work and school contacts, and other important numbers, doctors, pharmacists, that sort of thing. So have this on your cell phone, which most of you probably do already, but also have a paper copy somewhere, uh, preferably in your purse or a place that you can readily get to. Because if cell phones go down, or your battery goes down, then you don't want to rely on electronics. Have an out of state, what we call a family switchboard operator. So you might have somebody in, in Virginia, for example, who's networked into your whole family, that's a trusted aunt, for example, and they could take the word from you that you're okay. So you'd send a message saying, this is Aunt Mabel. I'm at Cousin Joe's in Odenton, safe and comfortable. And they would take all the family information and they can relay that information so your whole family will know that each other are safe. Almost everybody can do this. It can be a relative or just a friend. And the network can be two or three people or it can be 500 people, depending on how big your family is. If you do social media, for example, uh, Facebook, in certain storms or emergencies, they actually have an I'm OK button that you can click. And if your area has a tornado or a hurricane or snowstorm, you can click. And your friends on Facebook will know this is the same kind of thing without having social media. I was down at the Pentagon in 9-11-2011. Uh, we lost all of our telephone communications because the lines were so burdened, but text still went through. That's called short message system. So text is more reliable. So send who you are, where you are, and what your status is. That's the three things that your loved ones have to know. That makes sense. But when you get to this, you can click here. It actually walks you through all of this and gives you a sheet to think about all the kinds of things you have to do. If your family is large, it gets more complicated. Any questions about this?
So this is the list of things that you would have in a family emergency kit. Your go bag would be a subset of this. It would get you through as a person for 24 hours. The things we put in green are things we've added by the COVID virus. We used to say three days. Now we're talking about five days. I would say be prepared for at least uh, a week or two. And we've talked about some of these already. Most of the things as you read through this are things you already have at home. A few things you might not, but you don't want to wait till just before the storm to get these things together. Know where they are now. We keep our emergency kit in a big plastic tub down in the basement. So God forbid we ever have to use it at a tornado shelter. We've got it down there. If we have to evacuate, we have all this. We can put it together very quickly. We've added face coverings. So have two masks, uh, surgical cloth masks and surgical gloves. Have the hygiene items to include soap and hand sanitizer. And that's 60% alcohol or more. The garbage bags and some extra toilet paper as we found out that it can get in short supply quickly. And then we talk about one month's worth. Most of your doctors now will be pretty good about giving a month's worth of prescriptive medicine. Have all this on hand. Have paper maps in case your, uh, your phone goes down, you don't have GPS. Uh, and then have some cash on hand because the ATM systems might go down. So you might need cash for food or for gas or something else. The amount is up to you. If you don't have the money, I imagine most of this group probably has the, the funds to take care of this. But if you don't, you can go in with a neighbor or a family member and split the costs. And you can share the emergency kit. Again, we'd say two heads are better than one. So since you're working together already, go ahead and build your kit together. We talk about financial preparedness. So people don't think about this as emergency preparedness, but it indeed is part of it. So gather your critical information together now and keep it in a safe place. So we keep ours in a lockbox, uh, but we also have it on thumb drives. My son who lives in, in Howard County has a copy and then we keep it on a cloud, in the cloud, in a safe area in the cloud. So three different places, digital and physical. So you know where that information is. Again, we talk about a small amount of cash at home, cash in a safe place. And then if you don't have proper insurance, this is a good time to think about your insurance coverage. You may be underinsured. This applies whether you're talking about your home or your business. We have an entire different presentation for small businesses. So if any of your small business owners, let me know and we can give you that. It's a, a whole different presentation, but it talks about the needs of small business. Uh, by the way, 25% uh, of small business are going under right now because of this COVID price crisis. Uh, this is an incredible document. It's called the EFAC, the Emergency Financial First Aid Kit. So when you get this, just click on this link and it'll get, it's a really, really good document. It goes beyond just the things you would think about in finances. It talks about a lot of rainy day things that we never think about till it's too late. And then our friends in the Maryland Insurance Administration who really are good preparedness partners with us have a whole natural disaster preparedness guide for insurance. So are you underinsured? How do you prevent getting ripped off and conned after a disaster, that sort of thing? How do you report those sort of things? And they can really help you. They're good partners. And we call that financial preparedness. And we talk about our pets. Another quiz here. So you can either type it in or just come off a, somebody else answer that hasn't answered yet. So obviously we love our pets. Some of us love our pets like children. We have a cat, his name's Hank. So we, we love Hank and we take care of him. But what are two other reasons that we talk about pre pet preparedness? Can anybody give me a guess? Either type it in or, or come off speaker. Um, I guess, this is Chandra. I guess one that we talk about pets because not all shelters may take pets. That's correct. Uh, in fact, especially during a, uh, more so a hurricane than a, a snowstorm, those pets can get loose if they get out of your house and they can start getting wild and they go feral, they go wild and, and they can become a danger. And it also then takes other resources to either trap them or and God forbid, put them down. So that's one reason. What's another reason? What sometimes happens during fires? Anybody take a guess? So the fire departments come and they've rescued the little old lady from her house and she's safe, what happens? The pet is probably still there, they hide. They hide and what does the woman do or the person do? They run back in the house to get the pet. Uh, we lost 18 people in Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans because of that. They went back into their flood ravaged homes. They were rescued, they went back to get their pets. So we actually talk about pet preparedness as part of our emergency preparedness now. Uh, you see this list of things we get for the pet. So if, you're, if your dog or cat has a chip, uh, get to your veterinarian and get that chip identity number along with its tag number and take a picture of you and your animal together and then have your cell phone there. 
because in a major emergency, uh, we will actually set up pet reunification centers. We work with our animal control in the county to do that. And we've actually put a lot of uh, parents back together with their pets again. Uh, so those are the reasons we don't want to do that. If you think that doesn't happen here, think back to the, uh, to the Ellicott City, the old Ellicott crisis mm -hmm. about uh, three years ago. Uh, a lady went in to rescue her dog from the raging waters and she fell in. A gentleman reached into the water, pulled her and a dog to safety and he fell in and drowned. That young man was under 30 years old. He was a sergeant in the Maryland National Guard. He got the Army Heroism Medal, but he got it posthumously. So please take care of your pets. Think of them as, as family members. If you have a, a service animal, uh, like a seeing eye dog, for example, uh, then it's even more important to take care of those pets. So to be prepared, you've got to stay informed. So you're watching TV all the time. And the emergency alert system is the thing that you hear on the radio and TV that sounds very irritating. I'll try to imitate it. it it's irritating as heck and it's meant to be that way. Those are actually called unlock tones. That unlocks the system nationwide or for the area they're warning. Listen very closely for a high-pitched tone afterward. I'm not gonna imitate that, but a high-pitched tone afterward, which means a message is coming through and it's probably an emergency. Most of those you'll get here are weather emergencies like a, uh, a severe weather warning or a tornado warning. We actually had this happen uh, a couple of months ago in Edgewater. We had a tornado run down the South River and did some damage. Didn't hurt anybody, but did some damage. So yes, we get bad weather, serious weather here. That's called the emergency alert system. Another one is called wireless emergency alerts or WIAs. Those come to your cell phones, usually by the state. And that's how we get our amber and silver alerts. Can anybody tell me what an amber alert is? Somebody who hasn't answered. What's an amber alert? Amber alert is when a child has been abducted or is assumed in danger. That's and exactly right, Tiffany. Uh, abducted or they're lost. So uh, most of the time it is abduction, but it could be lost. And sometimes it could be parental abductions, but it's against the law and they can be in danger. Absolutely. Can you tell me what a silver alert is? It's an elderly person that is assumed to possibly be lost or endangered. Correct. They either have elder, they're elderly or they have dementia, or it can also be applied to, to people who have uh, 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 learning disabilities, uh, uh, developmental disabilities. So it might be somebody with Down syndrome, for example, who's wandered off. They tend to, to wonder. That's called elopement, that term, and it's exactly right. So you'll hear those. There's a third one you don't hear very often called a blue alert. A blue alert is, is for uh, law enforcement that are in trouble. So if there's, uh, so for example, a police officer might be kidnapped or something, uh, they could send that out. That's not done very often. So you'll hear silver and amber all the time. So here's our social media. We have an Office of Mercy website. Uh, we have a whole host of information on that website. And if you have children or grandkids, we have a whole section uh, of, of games to include some teenage games that are kind of fun. We have some survival games that they can actually uh, uh, go out and, and uh, survive a, a disaster. Our health department web, website has all the information you could ever want on COVID and any other kind of emergency. And then we have, my counterpart is a, is a 21 year old. She's a uh, Mead High grad, uh, emergency management expert. And, and we're the, uh, the granddaughter, grandson team, or granddaughter and grandpa team. Uh, I do all the personal outreach and she does all the social media outreach. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Nextdoor. I'm curious, how many people on this uh, call are on Nextdoor? Well, I always ask that. Some people think Nextdoor is great and some people think it's, it's a nuisance. I'm on it as well. So do you like it? Yvonne, what do you think? I think that it's helpful. Um, I've gotten a few alerts just within my community, but I also know that you still have to be vigilant in doing your own, um, I guess, knowledge checks and, you know, just make just checking all the various platforms because sometimes they're not as updated um, as I would, would like you're, it to be. You are absolutely correct. Uh, take everything with a grain of salt. Make sure that any emergency information you get are from a reputable source. So if you see it coming from uh, the police department, the fire department, the Office of Emergency Management, then, then you're going to get reputable information. So we use social media to do uh, preparedness, uh, to do warning, and to do guidance after an emergency. Some of you may have heard of this. The National Weather Service operates a 24-7 robot broadcast uh, called uh, NOAA Weather Radio. And you can get a small receiver. Uh, I have one that costs about $25. I got it on, uh, on uh, Amazon. And you can, it actually has a, a thing I can recharge my cell phone on it 
it has a little uh, solar strip on it that I can recharge it. And you can actually set it for uh, that frequency and that code, and it'll only trigger if there is a weather emergency in Anne Arundel County. Each county has a different one. You can actually put multiple counties in. Excuse me, but the one I have is only for our county. So you're not bugged by it all the time. And you can set the kind of emergency that you set it for. So you may only want to hear about warnings like a severe weather warning or a, uh, a snowstorm warning. Or you can set it for watches or even alerts of other kinds. They're inexpensive. And if you need assistive technology, they have some that have flashing lights and some that have actual readouts that tell you about the, the different kinds of things that might be going on. And then when you click here, you'll learn a lot more about it to include some different examples. And they're, again, not very expensive. If you have a business or you operate a, a school or something like that, I would strongly, strongly recommend you buy one of these uh, for your customers or your, or your clients. Now, this is very important. So we have a system we call Alert and Arundel. It's designed to send general or emergency notifications to our citizens. We can send it by text message, by voice message, or email, whichever you prefer. And we have multiple options that you can select, including 21 different languages. Now, our, our community is getting more and more diverse uh, from more, more uh, parts of the world. Uh, we have people immigrating here. So everyone knows our second language is, is Spanish. About 15% of our population speaks Spanish, either as their primary language or secondary. Can anybody guess what the third language is? Either type it in or, or just come off the speaker and let us know. Nobody wants to take a guess? Would it be those for um, those individuals who are hard of hearing or deaf? Yeah, uh, American Sign Language is, is absolutely, it's like, the, it's like the fourth or fifth. Uh, you're exactly right. But the third in this county now is, is Korean, Hangul. And then there are a number of other languages to include a lot of African dialects that are coming as people actually come over from Africa. Uh, so we have 21 different languages we now have all these messages in. A lady called the other day asking for, uh, she just immigrated from Afghanistan. Did, you, did we have the Urdu language? And yes, we did have it. And, and she has emergency notifications in her language, which is really good to have. You can sign up for free by visiting that address. We go to our website, which again, I'll give you later. Or you can simply call our number right there, 222-0600. If you have any questions after this, call that number and we'll sign you up uh, manually. Now, our county does not use a siren system. Why don't we use sirens anymore? Anybody take a guess? I didn't know we didn't use sirens anymore. <laughs> so Sean, why don't you think we use sirens? I mean, re honestly, what re initially came to my mind, I was thinking of all the autistic people in the world that it might cause some um, frustration for. Is that why? That is a very, very good point. And, and it's, it's true, but that's not why. We do okay. because people don't pay attention to them because they don't hear them. Oh. They're inside, they have their radios on, they have their headphones on, they've got their car uh, speakers on, and they just don't hear them anymore. And you'd have to have too many to have coverage and they don't tell you anything. A siren goes off, you don't know what it is. Is it a, is it a hazardous material alert? Is it a tornado alert? Is it a nuclear attack? You don't know. So this system will give you exactly what the message is. So if you're doing business in Baltimore City and you live in Annapolis, you will actually get an alert message that there is an active shooter, God forbid, in your general neighborhood or hazardous material, or as we saw in Edgewater, a tornado coming through Edgewater, and that all comes out through this. So it's a really, it's a free way to really keep in line. We're recommending anyone age 12 and above get this if they have a cell phone. When the power goes out, go ahead and call BGE. Uh, there's their number there because BGE tracks to general areas. They don't track necessarily the neighborhoods. So if you tell them your neighborhood's down, they can start putting it in their, in their uh, work orders. Uh, when you get this click on power outage, it'll take you to their entire prioritization process. And they actually have a map that shows you where they're working and, and their guess is when it's gonna come back. Uh, typically in a, in a big storm, our, our power will go out. So we say use flashlights or battery powered lanterns. I use one of the headlamps that has the band around my head. Uh, so it keeps my hands free. Uh, don't use candles. You don't wanna create additional hazards. So you've already got problems in the snowstorm uh, with the fire department getting to you. So don't burn down your house at the same time. So again, common sense. Charge your cell phones and your radio and have rechargeable batteries on hand and keep your refrigerators and freezers at maximum cold and keep the doors closed. 
Now, perishable food in a closed refrigerator, we say is only good for four hours. Anybody take a guess why? Somebody hadn't answered yet. Why only four hours? Especially if you have kids. That's a hint. Keep opening and closing the door. They do. That's, <laughs> absolutely, that's absolutely human nature, even if you're not kids. Uh, adults will do that too. Whereas a freezer will typically not be gotten into that often. It's a lot colder. So typically say two days. But we also say, if in doubt, throw it out. Because if something's gone over, even if it doesn't necessarily smell bad, you don't want to give yourself salmonella or some kind of other food poisoning on top of all the other emergency. Don't add, don't make yourself a victim. If you have, we said this before, but if you have any kind of electric powered medical equipment, go ahead. And if you don't have a generator, plan to go somewhere else that has one. If you have a generator, make sure it's properly installed and it's located uh, in a safe area that's at least 15 feet away from a door or window entrance. We have to say this, believe it or not, don't use gasoline machinery or propane power stoves or even a, a grill. People have actually brought hibachis, charcoal grills in their homes to either to keep warm or cook food. And of course that creates a carbon monoxide hazard. Again, don't add to the emergency. That's common sense, but hey, some people don't have common sense. When the power is restored, wait several minutes because we're on three cycle power. So if you notice next time, usually it'll take three times for the power to go down. So it'll go out and come back up. It'll go out and come back up. It'll go out the third time and stay down. The same thing when they bring it up, uh, wait for it to stabilize. It usually takes three cycles to stabilize. And especially with electronics, because you can blow out electronics, especially with something sensitive like a computer. And then keep your uh, car gas tank half full. Uh, that way you can get to safety because gas station pumps may not operate in an outage with the, with the power out. All this makes sense again, right? So if you go to this bg e link, they'll have you a lot more information on that. People always ask about snow plowing. So very quickly, uh, our Department of Public Works has the main and collector roads. So the main roads are your numbered roads and collector roads are the large roads that go between communities, plowed down to bare pavement. That's what it looks like there. And that allows our, our emergency responders to get in and out. Each residential road is eventually made passable and there's passable. That means that uh, a front wheel drive normal car can get through it at least one lane. Um, some residential roads though, especially cul-de-sacs may be privately maintained and privately owned and the county doesn't do that. The state highway uh, maintains all the numbered highways. So during a snowstorm, go ahead and park in your driveway or garage, keep snow out of the street and move your garbage containers uh, away from the actual plow path uh, so they don't destroy your garbage cont container if they don't see it. That makes common sense. Excuse me, Mr. Crumple, we do have one question. Sure. Um, there's a question regarding safety measures for storms that were similar to the Derecho storm that we had um, a couple of years ago. So Derecho is a very interesting one. So that's called a straight line wind storm. It's not associated with a typical storm front that you see. So you're not rain and, and uh, the potential for tornadoes. It is straightly wind storm. And the Derecho came through very quickly and did a lot of damage. So if anybody lives down on Central Avenue, down in the Mayo Peninsula area, south of Annapolis, there's only one way in, one way in and out, and that's 214 Central Avenue. During the derecho, it brought down two major trees which snagged high power lines. Those fell across the road. The lines were still alive, so they were dangerous, and they started a fire in the trees, completely blocked the road. We had to have uh, uh, DPW come out there along with the fire department, and then BGE came out and had to shut the power down before they could put the fire out, before they could remove the lines, before they could remove the trees. So people were essentially stuck on one or the other side of that road, only one way in or out, for about four hours. And we got a lot of calls at the emergency operations center then. People say, what do I do now? And we say, are you hurt? Are you in danger? No. So just stay at home and wait it out. Or if you're on the other side of the blockage, so that's a great question. That's a unique example of what happened. And that came through and did a lot of damage quite unexpectedly. And that's what a derecho is, a straight line storm. I, 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 asked, the question. I asked the question because I know we typically are prepared for snowstorms. We go to the store, we buy food, we know to stay in the house. But I know for me during that particular storm, we didn't have electricity for days and it was in the middle of the summer and we just didn't know what to do. So, you know, I noticed that you had, you mentioned the generator when we started talking about electricity and at that time, I was like, if I had a generator, all the hotels were booked up. So I was just trying to think in terms of what would be a emergency plan for something 
like that, I mean, God forbid it happens again, but it did happen. So Tiffany, you probably made the very best point of the night. There's no way I could have made a better point than you've done now. Everything we're talking about applies to any emergency at any time. You are dead on. So everything we've talked about, having the equipment on hand, making your plans in advance, uh, knowing how you'd evacuate if you had to evacuate, uh, all those things apply to any emergency because emergencies by their very nature are totally unexpected. And it could be a hazardous material, it could be a plane crash, it could be a lightning strike, it could be anything. The retro is a great example. I'm glad you brought it up. So everything we've talked about tonight is stuff to be prepared with. So if something does happen, you've made those plans and you have the things you need. Great point. Thank you. So this is the, uh, the planned completion of snow plowing. You see it's based on how, how heavy the snow is. Uh, we did have that uh, double 18 incher in 2011, I think it was. And this is down the main roads up to 60 hours. Now you think, well, that takes a long time, but look down here. They have to plow 6,300 roads and 1,300 cul-de-sacs. That's 3,600 total lane miles that the DPW has to do. It's a huge effort. They operate 24 seven. If you see a DPW plow truck pulled to the side of the road or maybe stopped at a Wawa, then don't immediately call and think that the poor guy is in there uh, goofing off. They work 24 hours a day and they do get breaks for their own safety. So they really do work hard. They have 72 dump trucks, 84 specific snow equipment, and 150 pieces of contractor owned for that, for all those miles that they have to do. So during a storm, you can get snow information at this address, aacounty.org slant snow, and you can find out what level of service that your own neighborhood or business will get. And better yet, go to the second address here, and again, you'll get a copy of this. The 511 portal will show you where all the snow plowing is happening. So you'll see where all the snow plows are and what they're doing. That's new, that happened last, started last year. If you have questions for snowfalls up to four inches or any road issues, so if you have road flooding or road blockage or road damage, and you live in the Northern District, which is basically the uh, Glen Burnie area, uh, Sever, Glen Burnie and above, that's their number. Central District is the middle part of the county. So you're talking about Severna Park, Annapolis area, and then Southern District is in South County you can call those numbers and, and get information. If we go over four inches or we have a major ice storm, then most likely our emergency operations center will be open. And that's our number there, 222-0600. Obviously emergencies call 911. And then that's the snowstorm center, 222-4040 for major snowstorms. And if you wanna report something on a numbered highway, either an interstate or a numbered state highway, that's the Maryland Highway Emergency uh, Operations Center. So again, I'll send you all these numbers. Everybody will get a copy of this uh, tomorrow. And I'll send it to you in PDF. You'll have all of this. But that's a really good one to go to. You can actually see where the snow plows are. So quickly, winter vehicle safety. So <clears throat> now at this very time, you should be winterizing your vehicle. I just did it for mine this week. Uh, before a snowstorm, make sure your battery is good, your tires are good. And make sure you have your survival kit here. You might want to add some things to it, but it's kind of a minimum. So we talked about having, uh, we talked about the family emergency kit and the personal go bag that you might have for 24 hours. So you can keep that go bag in your car, in your locker if you're at school, uh, in your business, wherever you might be. And you can keep it in your car, in your trunk. So you've got all that stuff to put in there if you should be stranded or you should be cut off. And then check this kit about every six months and replace any expired items. Again, common sense. But it's exactly as Tiffany said, plan for any emergency, plan ahead. Winter driving. So bottom line for all of this, if the travel is restricted, so if we have a major ice storm, please just stay home. Don't make yourself a victim. Just stay home unless there's an absolute emergency you need to. Stay in the warmth of your home with your family and friends and, and just enjoy the conditions there. Know the conditions before driving. And remember what I said early on, a winter weather advisory, the National Weather Service says it could be a nuisance. Ha! If you tried to commute from Severn to Washington, D.C. with a half an inch of snow on the ground, that's more than a nuisance. It doesn't take much to have major accidents. And you can see the other common sense things we have here. Slow down, allow greater braking, braking distance. Don't power up hills because you slide and try not to stop going up a hill because then what will happen is your tires will spin and you might go down that hill. So keep a constant pressure on. Just go more slowly, leave two or three car lengths you're supposed to leave a car link anyway, leave two or three in a snowstorm. If you're a little older, 
or the conditions are really bad, leave yourself even more time. Or better yet, just stay home if you don't need to go out. Now, if you do go out, if you're stranded, uh, so you run off the road. So the first thing is, uh, if you're just off the side of the road, go ahead and keep your seatbelt on and turn on your warning lights because other vehicles might spin out. You wanna make sure that they give as, as much margin around as you can. But if you're, if you're uh, uh, off the road, if you can see a building and it's clearly occupied, the lights are on, and you can see it enough to walk, to, you can get out of your car and safely walk to it. If you can't, stay with your vehicle. Your vehicle gives you more warmth and protection than getting out in the snow. We've had people, not in this county, but in Western Maryland, that have been less than 100 feet from their car during a blizzard, during a blinding snowstorm, and they have died because they didn't get to a building that was less than, than another few hundred yards from them. Clear your tailpipe out so you don't have carbon monoxide poisoning. Warm your vehicle up, then turn it off. So probably every 10 minute cycles when you get cold. Crack one window to avoid that carbon monoxide again. Uh, keep your lights on. You can also put a, a red or, or orange flare on your, if you have a, a, a radio antenna, a lot of cars don't have those these days. And then we talked about your emergency applies you put in your trunk. So this is the time to get them out and use them. Put that extra blanket on and then dial 911 or call AAA if you're not in any emergency uh, to come rescue you. Uh, again, conserve your cell phone battery. You can also buy one of those little battery chargers. They're small. They're a little smaller than a cigarette package. You can plug your cell phone into, It'll give you an extra shot of energy. They're usually charged up by USB cable, uh, either plugged in or off your computer. And that'll give you just enough to, to make an emergency phone call. So it's a good thing to have in your purse or your kit as well. Any questions about that? We don't get this so much in our county, except perhaps in South County, but out West, or if you're traveling out West uh, or on the Eastern shore, they do have this all the time. People do get stranded. After the storm, first thing you do is confirm, remember you first, you're not selfish. So confirm you and your family members are safe and then safely check on your neighbors, especially those that are older or have uh, chronic medical conditions. Check for any downed trees. So you be very cautious of power lines. You need to treat them as live, even if you don't see them sparking. If a power line is down, either call 911 or call BGE. They'll both talk to each other. Uh, you wanna stay at least 40 feet away from a down power line in any weather condition, but particularly in wet or snowy weather because that electricity can transfer across the ground in a wet condition. 40 feet is four car lengths. So imagine four car lengths between you and that wire being down. If a tree's falling on your home, you wanna make sure that your roof is stable. Uh, if you're, if, if you're in, in doubt of that, then leave the house and go to shelter and, and call a 911 to have the house checked out. We talked about uh, refrigeration. Don't travel if, if unnecessary. Uh, if you use a snow shovel or snow blower, or for God forbid, you use a chainsaw on down trees, please, please be careful. Uh, again, we don't want any more first aid emergencies on top of everything else. And expect to be self-sufficient for three to five days. So Tiffany made a great point again uh, during that derecho. Nobody expected to be down for that long, but some people are out for a full week in some cases. So if you are prepared for all this, everything we've told you, no matter what the emergency has, we call it all hazards preparedness. No matter what the hazard is, you'll be ready. And then once you've gone through one of these, go ahead and sit down with your family. And we don't care if your family is, is your 90 year old grandmother, as long as she can understand, or a nine year old child and talk about what you went through and what lessons you learned. Cause you can tell them things, but you might be amazed at what they can tell you as well. And because you are a service sorority, make sure and tell your sisters about this and tell their families. You are now ambassadors of emergency preparedness. So you are involved. The fact you're on this call tonight and you're taking your own time to do this means you're involved, even during the pandemic. So other ways to get involved would be to take a first aid course. You can take those uh, online. You can take a CPR course. They give one, but I don't know that you can actually get the card unless you're doing the, on, the hands-on. And then the health department now gives a new course called Stop the Bleed. And that is a, tra a traumatic injury course that talks about wound packing and tourniquets. Uh, and actually it started after uh, active shooters. So between the time somebody has been shot in an active shooter situation and EMTs get there, they can bleed out. So this is a way that you can become your own first responder and save lives. Those are three good courses we say take as a, as a triad, especially after the pandemic's over. You can request this presentation or we have a host of other presentations for your church or community group. 
So we have small business, we have licensed care facilities, we have church preparedness, uh, we have uh, different versions for youth, elementary school and high school age. We have a college age professional course that we can give. So any number of courses, you can call our number. Uh, again, 222-0600, we'll be glad to give you, we can give it in the evening, we can give it on weekends, we can give it during the workday. Uh, we talk about this a little bit. So our community emergency response team, CERT, is any CERT member on, on the call now? So CERT is Advanced Emergency Preparedness Training for Citizens. It's a volunteer group that's actually been given advanced training by FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency, and they do train the trainer. And you can get advanced training on everything I've talked about through them. Once you've taken that baseline training, if you'd like to become a volunteer in service to the county, then we give you a police background check. Uh, and then you can actually volunteer to support the county. You can work in our emergency operations center. You can work in our shelters. Uh, you can work in some of our uh, uh, feeding operations that we have. And we have about 100 volunteers doing it now. We would love, absolutely love Delta, Delta Sigma Theta to join us. Uh, take your ERT up a notch by taking the CERT course and then actually becoming part of our emergency management team. That would be awesome if, if some or all of you would like to do that. You're volunteering already. So you've you gotten Chapman checked already. Keep a watchful eye on your neighbors. So remember your neighbors don't necessarily have to be, have an infirmity or be old to have problems. Set the example by observing COVID precautions. So make sure and wear the damn mask as the, as the governor says, and set the example by being prepared. Again, by the fact you're on this call and asking great questions, it sounds like you are prepared. So here's a number of volunteer op opportunities I give you if, you if you don't know about them yet. All of these organizations and then some, we have great connectivity with. Remember when I was talking about whole community preparedness, I said we have 27 organizations that have reached out to us and we have network with now. This is a cross list of some of those that we have. Some of them uh, your sorority may be working with already and some of you may want to work with. All of them need help. And if you wanna reach out to me, uh, I can, I can uh, put you in contact with somebody from any of these. So if you're an amateur radio operator or a ham radio operator, you say, well, wait a minute, not likely that a woman will be. Actually, we have several female ham radio operators that are part of our emergency services team. Red Cross has a huge need right now for support, both in disaster preparedness, in helping with blood donations, which are a critical need, and helping with the military. That's a whole other area that they have. We talked about our CERT team, great training. Our food bank, 4 million pounds of food. They have a constant need for people to volunteer to help them. Catholic Charities operate a number of women and family shelters. They need help. Some of you are probably already involved in your food pantries. Anybody want to type in if they're involved in a food pantry and which church they're with? Yes, yeah, so this is Devanya. I, we actually partner through Life Church Min Ministries with um, the Maryland Food Bank. So you're already there. That's great. Now, is that you alone or is that your church? That's with the church. Okay, that's fantastic. We have 47 churches that responded to this emergency and we have great need. We need all the more. So you see right there, uh, Restoration Community Development Corporation, Light of the World Family Ministries. Uh, that's Cheryl uh, Menendez. She's a reverend uh, that has a church down in Annapolis and in Glen Burnie, and she is doing absolutely world-class work feeding the hungry, working with uh, our, our, our food bank. Well, another group we have is the Partnership for Children, Youth, and Families. They have volunteers helping too. A lot of need out there. If you have a medical background, uh, no matter what it is, or you're interested in something, you could join the Medical Reserve Corps, and we can have you uh, sign up for that too. That's done online that's state managed, and you can help out with any number of things that they might need for that. And then there's another group called So Maryland in Arundel, Prince George's County. They have sewn uh, 10,000 protective masks, cloth masks for school children, for the needy and for others. And we have a new mask drive out right now to help children with some disabilities. So there's a lot of opportunity for you as individuals or you as a sorority to do. For more information, again, that's how to reach us. And I'll give you a copy of all this. How to reach the Department of Health for just nauseating detail on COVID and other health issues. The National Weather Service for winter weather. So if you wanna know more about each of the things I talked about, and then FEMA, this is planning ahead. So getting back to Tiffany's point, all disasters, we call it all hazards right there. 
So there's the COVID virus and there's this poor moose. Don't get like the moose, don't be snow laden. So we ask everybody to answer your question now, are you ready? What questions do you have? I gave you a lot of information in a short amount of time. So if there's no questions, again, I'm going to give you a PDF with all this. After you've read it, or you're interested in volunteering for something, either as individuals, or maybe as a church group, or a civic group, uh, or as a sorority, go ahead and let me know and we can, we can put you in contact with them. Any questions at all? Sean, anything uh, for the group? I was getting ready to say, I don't have any questions. I think I am actually, and I, I've been in Anne Arundel County for over, I don't know, 25 years um, with the school system. And there's a lot of stuff you shared that I just did not know. <laughs> and I am, I'm involved with the partnership. I'm involved with Cheryl Menendez and all the things that she does across the county and feeding and those things. And so this was absolutely awesome information. Um, and I can't wait to share this presentation on our social media site so that we can inform more in the community because I've been here a while and a lot of what you shared, I was didn't know. So thank you, James. You're very welcome. It's very exciting to see a civic oriented group like this. Uh, you're already kind of self-organized to do this sort of thing and you're doing it. Just mm -hmm. do it more. We need as many hands as we can right now. Absolutely. So we, we took a lot of time. Again, I'll send you a copy of this. Shandra, may I use you as a point of contact? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I'll send this out uh, again in PDF, send it uh, far and wide and send the recording out to anybody you want to, uh, that's fine too. And then reach out to us with any questions you have or if you wanna volunteer. Uh, it sounds like Sean is already involved in a lot of things. Probably a lot of you are already, I suspect mm -hmm. you are. So again, the more hands, the merrier. We need all the help we can get. This pandemic is going to get worse over the next two months, but then it's going to get better. But who knows what emergencies are in store for the future. So thank you all for your time. You've been an absolutely terrific audience and God bless you for what you do for your community. Thank you, James. This was awesome. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. You might have other business. Chandra, you want to close us out? Um, so, yeah, so thank you, James, Mr. Cromwell. Thank you, everyone, for attending um, this awesome workshop. On, I'm, I'm sitting here like Sean. I'm just learning a lot of, you know, um, new information. So we hope that we found this, um, that you found the information very helpful and informative. And if there is something else that you would like to learn about as emergency management, we are going to be um, connecting with the Office of Emergency Management to, to bring more community preparedness um, workshops to the community, to the community so that we can first and foremost, one, um, take care of ourselves so we can be in service to others. So thank you everyone for um, joining in this evening. Thank you, Chandra. Great job. Thank you everyone on the line, on Zoom participating. Um, and you'll see this again because we're as soon as the video uploads, I'll be sharing this with our tech team to, to post. Bye-bye now. All right. Bye. Thank, thank you. you.